How does Mark tell the story of the end of Jesus? That's what we're going to find out in Mark 15. Wow. So Mark does go by very quickly. And now Jesus is brought very first thing in the morning, maybe because the Romans got up early, but the chief priests wanted it to be the first order of the day to bring Jesus over to Pilate. He was bound and probably abused and probably haven't had a meal. So he was probably weak at this point and delivered him to Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate says, so are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus only says, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of all these things. And Pilate just says to him, aren't you going to respond? Aren't you going to answer these charges? Look at all these things they're saying about you. Aren't you going to say anything? And Jesus made no further answer, it says in ESV. Pilate was amazed. Now, I'm sure that Pilate had seen this many times before, had many people brought to him. They begged They pleaded for mercy. They said why they didn't do it. They defended themselves. And instead, God doesn't say anything except you have said it. That is not how people act in front of Pontius Pilate. And you don't get to be governor by being some kind of weak man, someone who doesn't hear that. But he also seems to have a sense of, I guess, fairness. Romans killed a lot of people in battle, but they didn't just tend to slaughter people without some kind of a trial, some kind of a process. He heard, I mean, what Jesus was saying. He heard what the elders were saying against him. He was listening to this whole thing. He didn't have any horse in this race. He doesn't care about messiahs. He doesn't care about anything except for keeping the peace. He doesn't want people getting upset, running into riots, you know, making a mess of this. Again, you don't get to be a governor of a place like this by screwing up all the time. But you also don't get to be the governor of a place way back in the backwoods of the world by being the best. This was his chance to do a good job and move up the ladder, so to speak. So he took his job very seriously and seemed to have some sort of sense of fairness. So Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. There's many more details that goes on. We'll see them in other gospels about the back and forth between it. But it says that he releases one prisoner. And I think in a sense, he thought, oh, this is my chance to get out of this. It says in other gospels that he didn't really think Jesus did anything wrong. And it even says it here. He perceived that this was out of envy by the chief priest to bring him up to these charges. And so he said, okay, well, here's this horrible man, Barabbas. He's a murderer and an insurrectionist and he's causing trouble. And here's this nice Jesus who you seem to think he's the king of the Jews. Let's see who we should let go. The chief priests were out among the crowd telling everyone, choose Barabbas to be set free. So Pilate says, who do you want to let go? This man, the king of the Jews? That's the second time he called Jesus the king of the Jews. And they said, crucify him. I said it in my other podcast. I'll say it here. If God picked the Norwegians to be the chosen people of God, these would be Vikings. And if he picked the Midwesterners in the United States to be the chosen people of God, we would be throwing our corn cobs at him. This is not about who is saying it. The blood of Jesus is on all our hands. We would all cry to crucify him. He doesn't get it. He says, what has he done? What evil has he done? And people are still screaming about it. Are some of these the very people who follow Jesus in the countryside? Are some of these people the very people who were saying, Hosanna, save us? Or is this the very crowd of people who came with clubs and swords? Either way, they were set up against Jesus. And Jesus, not wanting to make a deal of it, released Barabbas. I'm sure that bugged him because they probably spent a lot of time finding Barabbas. Is a name, and most names in Hebrew mean something. So Bar is the son of, like Bar Mitzvah. Abbas means the father. So he is called the son of the father, while Jesus is actually the true son of the father. One of them is a real criminal and is set free. And the other one who did nothing wrong and is the true son of God, he's the one who was delivered to be crucified. And what everyone in the commentaries said is this is us. We are the ones that are set free for any sins that we committed, any time we didn't treat people the way we should have treated people. Anyways, we shouldn't have respected God the way we should have respected God. 
We are Barabbas. We are the ones set free. And Jesus was the one who took on the punishment. And what's interesting, too, is that, you know, Pilate calls Jesus the king of the Jews. He didn't mean it either, because if Jesus had been going around calling himself the king of the Jews, we would have had to take him out because we wouldn't even letting Herod's son call himself the king of the Jews. We don't want any political shenanigans going on at all. So the soldiers let him away. These are probably going to be, I believe, the Sanhedrin's soldiers. And they took him a place inside the palace, the governor's headquarters. So the soldiers let him away. They said that there was a place inside the palace of the governor's headquarters. This used to be Herod's headquarters. And it said the whole battalion. They clothed them in a purple cloak. Some people call it like a more maroon kind of color. And twisting together a crown of thorns, put it on him and saluted him. Hail, King of the Jews. I mean, these were paid soldiers. They got a kick out of treating people poorly. Pilate had to be a bit of an adult in this, and the the soldiers didn't. And then striking him and spitting on him and, you know, fake um, bowing down to him. And then they stripped him of the purple cloak, and then they put his own clothes back on him and let him out to be crucified. This is the location I stayed at when I stayed at in Jerusalem. We probably went there a dozen times, and, and the nuns who run this convent showed us all the places, you know, where there was part of it. To, to be in this place, even when I was an atheist, and just touch the walls that maybe Jesus touched as he was trying to stand back up. Oh, boy. But the whole point of this is just mocking and scorn, which was also foretold. So then, as we're going to bring Jesus to the crucifixion, Simon of Cyrene was coming up. It says he came from the country, and he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. They called on him, the soldiers called on him to help Jesus carry the cross. He's been beaten, he's been whipped, he probably hasn't eaten, and he's not strong enough anymore at this point to carry his own cross. We'll hear of Alexander and Rufus in later chapters of Acts, I believe. But we don't know Simon. We just know where he's from, which is in Africa. But we will hear of his children. So he helps bring the cross, cross beam, to the place. It's called Golgotha, which means literally place of the skull. I mentioned in the Small Steps with God that there's a place that looks like a skull. And Helena who is Constantine's from like 330 AD, Constantine's mother went on a pilgrimage to the old city and found relics, found Golgotha. And so primarily Golgotha among Catholics is considered to be where Jesus was crucified. Protestants, on the other hand, think that it's this other place, which is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. They said that Golgotha, where Helena picked, is too far off the road. The point of crucifixion is so everybody can see it. Everybody walking by going, this is what happens when you cause trouble right here. And so that they would not have taken it so far away from the city where people wouldn't have seen it. So there's two locations where people primarily believe is the place that Simon helped bring the cross. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh. They believe that there was painkillers in it so that he wouldn't feel the full brunt of what's going to happen. And it says he didn't take it. They divided his garments, casting lots. And then on the third hour when they crucified him, and it says it was in the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription that they put on the cross was the King of the Jews. That's where you see the initials I-N-R-I. That's what it means, the King of the Jews. It was meant as a mocking And then he had two robbers, one on his left and one on his right. And they were like, it says, wagging their heads and deriding him. Oh, if you can destroy the temple and rebuild it, come down off that cross and save yourself. And so the chief priests were there. The scribes were also mocking him. Everyone was there mocking him. He can't even save himself. That's what kind of savior is he? And then mocking him to come down off the cross. And my first thought when reading this particular part is that James and John, the sons of thunder, said, we want to sit on your left and your right. Obviously, they meant in heaven or in his coming kingdom. But who sat on his left and his right? Two robbers. That's who did. And the robbers themselves were even mocking him. The third hour itself, it said that was a special time for crucifixions. Again, we talked about the four watches. The third hour 
was essentially going to be where judgment was put down. And that's when they crucified people. And it even gets stronger. They're saying that the language that was used about the robbers who were mocking him was literally to throw insults, but it also could be meant as blaspheming. Oh boy. So they are seriously taking words at Jesus and throwing it at them, the worst kinds of things that you could say. So at the sixth hour, darkness went over the whole land until the ninth hour. They had three hours of darkness. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders heard it. And in Aramaic, which I believe is what he would be speaking, it means Eloi, Eloi. And they probably thought they heard Elijah. And they're like, oh, he's calling for Elijah to come take him down. They're still making fun of him. And so then they were all like, well, maybe Elijah will come and get him. Maybe that's what's going to happen next. And then Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn. I was told that that was meant that you only had the high priest who was allowed to go into the temple. He'd be a descendant of Levi, one of the priestly class. That's done with. There's no more separation. There's no more priest class who separates us from God. We now have direct connection to God. And then when a centurion was watching him breathe his last, he says, truly, this was the son of man. The very first person to declare this was a Roman. And the Romans would have been, wow. The women were watching as a distance. And it says that time he was in Galilee, the women who were the people who followed him and ministered him, there were also many other women that came up with him to Jerusalem. Where were the men? Well, it said they scattered, but the women were watching from a distance. So I wonder, too, if there was some kind of a danger that they, too, could be arrested. It says in the commentaries that the Greek does not have a definite article before the term son of God. And so that means this is son of God, meaning the Messiah, not a son of God, not a child of God. This is the Messiah. They would have understood what he was saying here. And so Mark, again, leaves his audience and says, and it's, you know, as if to say, this would be a challenge, I think, to many Romans to say, look, this centurion said he was son of God, the Messiah. Who do you say he is? Then when evening came and the Passover and the Sabbath was over, they took him down. So now we have to hurry because this is the time before the Sabbath. And no work can be done. If he was not buried before Sabbath, he could not be buried and his body would be left there. So Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, it says, quote, was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Would have maybe been turned over to the family. Some people got buried into a pit as a common criminal. And when Pontius Pilate heard that he was dead already, that was surprising. I mean, usually they don't die that quickly. So he asked the centurion to come to him and gave to Joseph the body of Jesus. Because it was quick timing, they brought linen, they took Jesus down and wrapped him in the shroud and laid him in the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had for his own family, his own tomb. And then the stone is rolled. And this is a huge stone. So think about it as a stone that someone could get into a cave, into the stone cut rock with. And so it's going to be heavy. And then it was rolled against the tomb and they saw where he was laid. So they got to witness the fact that he was buried. This was a kindness of a very wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. So this would have been Joseph's own tomb. Again, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. And this was a pretty bold thing for him to go and bury Jesus. So my meditation this week is going to be about Joseph of Arimathea. He had a high position. He was one of the members of the Sanhedrin, which was one of the 77 judges as part of it. He probably witnessed this sham trial that Jesus went through. To think about how bold it was for him to come forward and ask Pilate, who was a Roman, he probably didn't want to talk to the Romans, to then bury the body of Jesus. The word would have gotten out that he was the guy who buried Jesus. Instead of letting him go into some sort of criminal's burial or let Mary quietly bury him someplace else, boy, having someone with that importance bury you, that would have said something big. That's a lot of boldness. My prayer 
is about all the people who had witnessed this. The apostles who ran, Judas who betrayed him, and the women who had to stand back and be afraid. My prayer for all of us is that we can have the boldness that God gives us in order to stand up to the people who are doing clearly an evil thing and be stronger about it. And what I'm going to share is that Jesus died and the very first person who acknowledged him as the Messiah was a Roman. This gospel is for everybody, no matter what you did. That was a centurion who participated in the death of Jesus, and yet he recognized this is the Son of God. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. Please leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast as well. Thank you very much for listening.